So we left off last time talking about how when we see changes in a population over time or evolution, there's more than one kind of thing that we can point to to explain that change. The first thing we looked at is sexual selection. So the idea that choosiness for certain traits on the parts of a male or female can cause that trait to become more common over time. So there's that change over time piece. We then looked at artificial selection, and this is where we left off, with the idea that humans can choose for traits and therefore make that trait more common over time. So again, this would be evolution. What we need to kind of talk about a little bit with artificial selection is how this choosiness of humans for certain traits over time has actually been disadvantageous for certain populations. So the issue with this is that um, when we have, when humans have a certain organism that we like in terms of taste or production or a trait we like, we tend to breed for that pretty consistently. So we've ended up what are known as uh, monocrops. So we end up with crops that are fairly genetically identical to one another. And the issue here is that when you have a lack of genetic diversity or, you know, or diversity in your populations, it means that when you have an environmental change, your population is equally either well adapted or unadapted to deal with that change. And so I'll give you a concrete example of kind of what I'm talking about in terms of downsides of artificial selection. So if we take a look at the banana, up at the top you can see world banana production by type and we notice the clear winner here is the Cavendish banana. A little less than half of the bananas bred in the world are Cavendish bananas. Now Cavendish bananas are clone crops. What that means is that when you have an entire banana farm that is growing Cavendish bananas, each tree is a clone of the other one, meaning they're genetically identical. It's almost like identical twins, but for plants. And the idea here is that it's helpful for the farmer because if you like the taste of one Cavendish banana, you'll like the taste of all Cavendish bananas because they're all genetically identical to each other. The downside here though is that recently there have been fungal outbreaks in these Cavendish banana plants all over the world. So South America, Africa, where primarily a lot of these crops are grown, and once one tree gets affected, the entire plantation gets wiped out. So you can see kind of the middle picture over here we have, this is what the fungal spores look like when they grow inside the banana. So obviously nobody's gonna eat that, it's a destroyed crop. And then down here you can kind of see all of the plants dying and stuff because of these fungal infections. So farmers have tried to slash and burn, they've tried to kind of isolate populations that are affected, but there's a, a huge financial and also human cost to this issue. But the big biological thing we want to point to here is that this is happening because there's a lack of diversity in the banana population. Humans have selected for a single type of banana that's identical. And because of that, once this fungus was able to attack one of them, it could get to every single one of them. So the last type of selection, so the last type of process that can push change in a population over time or drive evolution is probably the one we're most familiar with. And this is evolution by natural selection. So in natural selection, it's changes in the environment that drive a population to change over time. So if I summarized up each of our different types of selection in sexual selection, it's mating preference, artificial selection, it's humans, and in natural selection, it's the environment that drives change. So this was obviously the mechanism or the way that we can see change in a population over time that was put forth by Charles Darwin. So here we have a Charles Darwin picture with very gradual change we can believe in. So he famously came up with this idea after a very long voyage on the Beagle as the ship's naturalist, where he looked at a lot of different organisms in different places around the world. Most famously, he went to the Galapagos Islands off the coast of South America, specifically Chile. And he noticed that on each of the islands, there were finches but the finch beaks and their structures were very, very different. And he took a look at the local flora, fauna, so plants and animals, and he came to the conclusion that these finches had initially been one population, but that population had gotten spread out over all of these islands. And then on each island, there had been different selective pressures in the environment. So for example, one island might have been drier than another, so had less rainfall. And because of that, it might have had smaller seeds growing there. And so you would end up with birds that maybe feed on insects instead, or maybe birds that are feeding on flowers. And then you might end up with birds that are on very wet islands. So they might end up with um, bigger beaks to deal with being able to chew through bark or things like that. But in either case, all the variation we see here is due to the environment driving that change. 
So the idea here and the other big idea is that natural selection is going to lead to organisms that are better adapted to their environment. This is not necessarily true for sexual selection, and it's definitely not true for artificial selection. But natural selection inherently is going to make organisms that are better adapted to their environment. And we use this word adapt or adaptation, but what it actually is, is an adaptation is a change in an organism. So this is typically a physiological or a physical change that makes that organism better able to survive and reproduce in its environment. So the example I have over here is your armadillo. So the, what Charles Darwin would say and what evolution by natural selection tells us about the armadillo's thick skin is that initially you would have had some mutation in the population that led to thicker skin on one armadillo. That armadillo had increased resistance to predators because they were less likely for a predator to be able to attack and eat them because they had that thicker skin. This thick skin armadillo gets to survive and reproduce. That thick skin then gets considered an adaptation. It's giving that armadillo a survival and a reproductive advantage over all the other armadillos. Now, over time, we give it lots and lots of time, and we notice when we look at armadillos, they all have this thick skin because it gives you such a great survival and reproductive advantage. So just to quickly recap kind of our first two bits. So the first thing we wanted to do was we wanted to answer the question, what is evolution? And so we learned evolution is just change in a population over time. And that's our end for our definition of evolution. When we look at what factors can cause a population to evolve, so these are the mechanisms that might drive evolution, that's where we come out with our sexual selection, artificial selection, and then the one we'll spend the most time on in class, which is natural selection. But all three of those are capable of giving us that change over time or that evolution that we see. The next video will pick up looking specifically at natural selection. We're gonna look at the tenets of natural selection. Tenants are foundational principles. So when we propose this idea, this theory, that organisms change over time in response to the environment, we have to look at what are kind of the ideas or evidences that hold that up. 